Released from North Korea, Australian Alex Sigley on his way home after the intervention of Swedish diplomats. Tax cuts for Australians. Labor decides not to oppose the $158 billion package in the Senate. Hands off Hong Kong. China issues a stern warning to former colonial rulers Britain. And deadly attraction. A hiker is killed as Italy's Mount Stromboli erupts. This is SBS World News with Darren Mara. Good evening. Australian student Alex Sigley has been released from detention in North Korea. Swedish government officials secured the release of the 29-year-old who had been detained since last week. Safe at last. 29-year-old Australian student Alex Sigley emerging at Beijing Airport after being released from detention in North Korea. I'm, I'm OK, I'm OK, yeah, yeah, I'm good. I'm very good. How do you feel? Great. He had lost contact with family members over a week ago, prompting fears the North Korean regime had detained him. But he declined to elaborate on what had happened to him. So could you explain what happened in Pyongyang? Just leave it for a moment. Yeah. On arrival in Beijing, he departed for the Australian Embassy, his release announced in Parliament. I'm sure we all could not be more pleased that we not only know where Alex is, but we know he is safe. This is indeed good news for Alex, his family, and indeed good news for our nation. His release comes after a vigorous diplomatic effort by the Swedish authorities, one of the few Western nations that maintains diplomatic relations with North Korea. On Monday, the Swedes sent a special envoy and delegation to Pyongyang, who lobbied on Australia's behalf for his release. The Swedish envoy alongside the Australian as he touched down in China. On behalf of the Australian Government, may I express our deepest gratitude to Swedish authorities for their prompt and invaluable assistance in securing Alex's uh, prompt release. Mr Sigley is the only Australian believed to be living in North Korea, where he ran a tour company and studied at university. He frequently tweeted about his experiences as he led tourists around parts of the country. His family relieved of the shock news their son is now free. We're over the moon that he's um, safe and sound and I'm sure that in the coming days, coming weeks, there'll be some more information about uh, exactly what, what has transpired. His father saying he is expected to return home to Australia in the coming days. Johnny Blakali, SBS World News. CNN correspondent Paula Hancocks joins us now live from Seoul. Paula, uh, this quick release has come as a bit of a surprise. Do we know why he was detained in the first place? No, Darren, we've had no clarity on that at this point. We, we really don't know why, uh, why North Korean authorities decided to detain him last week. He, uh, he was met by journalists, Alex Sigley, as he touched down in Beijing airport, and he was asked about that, and he declined to, to give any information about it. He had someone walking alongside with him, potentially someone from the embassy or consular support, uh, who said, let's not talk about that at the moment. So clearly in the days to come, we're, we're likely to get a little more information about why he was detained. But it's worth noting that North Korea hasn't even publicly said anything about Alex Sigley and the fact he was detained yet. And do you have more details as to how his release came about? It was all down to, to the Swedish authorities, and we heard Prime Minister Morrison uh, saying that as well, saying that he has great appreciation for the Swedish envoy. This is something that Sweden has done a number of times before when it comes to detainees in Pyongyang. He's done it for, the, they've done it for the United States because the US doesn't have diplomatic uh, connection in Pyongyang, uh, and they really have a lot of experience in trying to negotiate for the release of, uh, of these detainees with the North Korean officials. Now, now, certainly this 
uh, episode has been resolved a lot quicker than uh, than many of pr the previous detainees. But of course, we we simply don't know why Alex Sigley was uh, was detained in the first place. He is well known to to many North Korean uh, watchers. He he tweets quite regularly about his experiences within the country. He's lived in Pyongyang since last year. Uh, he he founded a tour group as well, so he's been uh, taking tourists in for, for educational and cultural exchanges. So at this point, there really is a big question mark as to why someone like that, uh, with such close connections to North Korea, would have been detained by authorities. Darren? OK, thank you, Paula. Paula Hancock's there from Seoul. 10 million Australians are set to receive a tax cut with the government's multi-billion dollar economic plan expected to pass the Senate. Labor's pulling its opposition after four key crossbenchers shifted their support to the coalition. It was a budget and tax plan Scott Morrison was banking on. Welcome to the year of the first budget surplus in 12 years, Mr Speaker. And having just lost an election opposing both, late this afternoon, Labor finally conceded defeat. We won't oppose the full package uh, if it comes to the Senate unamended because our highest priority is to make sure that Australians do receive that tax cut next week. Instead, vowing to review stage three of the seven-year $158 billion plan at the next election. All sides of politics review, depending upon economic circumstances, uh, we will do that. We'll put forward our own policies. Labor capitulating after Jackie Lambie confirmed she would back the government. I've got small businesses down there in sufferance. So you know what, I'm not sitting around on this for another four or five weeks while we play argy-bargy. In return for action on Tasmania's multi-million dollar social housing debt. My negotiation isn't with the media, OK. I'm on goodwill here. I'm quite sure there'll be a lot more detail on that in the next six or eight weeks. Government's chief negotiator says we'll have to wait. You agree to wipe out Tasmania's social housing debt at well, the cost of $157 again, million? What, what we've agreed is to work with uh, uh, Senator Lambie in relation to policy issues that she's raised with us. I don't know what the quid pro quo uh, is or I don't know what deal has been done with the government but what I do know is that I think she's played this very, very smart. Corey Bernardi and Centre Alliance will also back the plan in full in return for action to drive gas prices down. There is no agreement that says if you vote for the tax cuts we will do this. An utter refusal by the government to give any details of this special deal. Your position has got no credibility, you're all over the place, you've got more positions on tax than in the Kama Sutra quite frankly. The only opposition coming from an unlikely alliance. One Nation. Tax offsets, offsets are a sugar hit. And the Greens. Jackie Lambie thinks she's a hero this morning, but what she is, is a bloody sellout. Having tried and failed to simultaneously deny higher income earners a tax cut while matching one's promise to low and middle income earners, Labor believes its best political shot is a tactical retreat. Tonight, attempting to shift the economic pressures onto Scott Morrison. What programs and services will be cut to fund stage three of the government's tax scheme? Yeah, yeah. The Prime Minister. None. The... In a worsening economy, others in the coalition are far less certain. And Chief Political Correspondent Brett Mason joins us now from Canberra. Brett, this is a big win for Scott Morrison. Well, Darren, it sure is. The opposition effectively delivering the government's key election promise. These are live pictures inside the Senate chamber right now where the opposition is supporting in full the coalition's seven-year, $158 billion tax plan. And insiders tell me they really had no choice on this, despite having called it irresponsible and reckless all throughout the election campaign and the first sitting week of the 46th Parliament. Even if the crossbench had endorsed their amendments, carving off the higher income tax cuts and bringing forward other cuts for low and middle income earners, it would have ping-ponged back to the House of Representatives where the coalition would have used its majority to send it back. It really was a case of all or nothing for Labor. And this afternoon, caucus decided that ultimately it 
it was far less damaging to wave these tax cuts through rather than stand in the way of tax relief for some 10 million Australians. Of course, some Labor supporters tonight are asking, well, what does the opposition stand for having campaigned so strongly against this tax agenda? And for Scott Morrison, this victory really hasn't come at much of a price. The coalition under his leadership was already working towards driving down energy prices. It had began to review a lot of its energy policy anyway and underwriting a couple of hundred million dollars in the grand scheme of things in terms of Tasmanian state government debt isn't really a huge price to pay. So it's safe to say, Darren, that Scott Morrison is pretty happy with his first week here in Canberra. OK, thank you, Brett. Brett Mason there from Canberra. A divided UN Security Council has refused to condemn one of the deadliest assaults on civilians since the Libyan civil war began in 2011. That's despite UN claims that the bombing of the Tajura migrant detention centre, killing at least 44 people, could be classed as a war crime. Home to mainly African migrants, Tajura is in suburban Tripoli, next to the Daman government militia base, a target for the forces of renegade military commander Khalifa Haftar. Fleeing poverty and war at home, now victims of a war they have nothing to do with. Survivors of the migrant centre bombing scour the debris for belongings still intact. Some people wound, wounded and they die on the road on their way running. And some people are still under the, under the block. So we don't know what to say. All what we know is we, are, we want the UN to help people out of this place because this place is dangerous. The UN Security Council has discussed the carnage, which the UN-backed government in Tripoli blames on its opponents, the eastern-based Libyan National Army of Khalifa Haftar. Although the US issued a statement calling the bombing abhorrent, diplomats say it blocked a statement urging a ceasefire and condemning the incident. It's unclear why. The UN human rights chief saying the attack could amount to a war crime. It is important to note that the United Nations had provided exact coordinates of the detention center to the parties. Despite that information and UN concerns about migrants in the firing line, it was the second strike there during recent fighting. This is a tragedy that was very much preventable. Just where a couple of months ago, we called for the urgent evacuation of people from this specific detention centre after a similar airstrike injured two of the people inside. Uh, but sadly, no action was taken in that regard. Some LNA representatives said the nearby militia camp was targeted, but not the detention centre itself. One general suggesting the immigrants were there due not to neglect, but as human shields placed by an opposing militia. They do not care about violating human rights. They are uncontrolled groups who don't follow humanitarian rules. It hurts us that the immigrants have been used for this purpose. Britain and other EU nations pay Libya to stop migrants arriving in Europe. Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt denies his country is shirking moral responsibility by ignoring their fates afterwards. The situation with migration is also caused by the instability in the political situation in Libya. And, you know, Britain has been working night and day to try and get a ceasefire. That's a distant prospect. Haftar forces warning this week they'll step up their bombardment of Tripoli. Renis Arampayat, SBS World News. Russia has finally confirmed the submersible which caught fire, killing 14 elite members of the Navy, was nuclear powered. An investigation is taking place at a naval base in Russia with the Kremlin criticised for covering up crucial details about the incident. Comparisons are being made to the former Soviet Union's handling of Chernobyl. Touching down in Severomorsk, the Russian Defence Minister is in damage control, continuing to suppress the details behind Monday's devastating submersible fire while praising the 14 highly skilled officers who died in it. The 
Late Thursday, the Kremlin finally confirmed the sub involved was nuclear powered. Other than that, it's keeping tight lipped. Officially, this was a research mission surveying the Barents Sea floor. Analysts are backing local media reports that the vessel involved was the Loshirik. Details on the top secret sub, part of Russia's northern fleet, are scarce. It's believed the submersible can hold 25 crew members and dive up to six kilometres. The Loshirik is nuclear powered. A fire on board could pose a major environmental threat. Neighbouring Norway is monitoring radiation levels. Authorities there say they haven't detected anything abnormal. Russia's secrecy on the sub and its potential nuclear impact is drawing parallels to the Soviet Union's handling of the Chernobyl disaster. But the Kremlin is standing firm. The Russian Defence Ministry has released the names and pictures of the victims. Among them were two recipients of Russia's highest honour, the hero of the Russian Federation Award. The seniority of the crew adding to the intrigue. Rachel Carey, SBS World News. Tensions between the UK and China are rising after the two men vying to become the new British Prime Minister both expressed support for Hong Kong's protest movement. Beijing has described the comments as examples of faded colonialism. As the clean-up continues in Hong Kong's parliament, a diplomatic spat between the UK and Chinese authorities is getting messier. The man most likely to become Britain's next Prime Minister expressed his unequivocal support for the protesters. Yes, I do support them and uh, I will happily s speak up for them and, uh, and back them every inch of the way. Similar sentiments from his rival for the Tory leadership. We urge the authorities not to use what happened as a pretext for repression, but rather to understand the root causes of what happened, which is a deep-seated concern by people in Hong Kong that their basic freedoms are under attack. The comments have caused outrage in Beijing. Britain handed control of Hong Kong back to China in 1997. The deal required the region to be afforded a high degree of autonomy for 50 years. But protesters say their freedoms are being eroded. This week's demonstrations were sparked by a now suspended bill that would allow extradition to mainland China. Even though she's leaving office in a fortnight, Theresa May's approach to the situation has been a little more diplomatic than that of the men vying to replace her. And it's vital that Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy and the rights and freedoms set down in the Sino-British Joint Declaration are respected. Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt have not clarified what practical steps they would be willing to take, if any, to back the Hong Kong protesters. So for now, it's just tough talk. But China is warning that strong language can have consequences. Uh, if British government go further, it will cause further damages. So that's why I'm calling the British government to reflect the consequences of its words and deeds. China's ambassador to the UK was later summoned to the Foreign Office and asked to tone down his rhetoric. In London, Ben Lewis, SBS World News. One person has died and dozens have been injured in a dramatic volcano eruption on the Italian island of Stromboli. The volcano was known to be active, but authorities say these explosions were particularly powerful, enveloping the island in ash and sending tourists fleeing from the popular tourist destination. The Navy has been deployed for a possible mass evacuation of the island as firefighters continue to battle small blazes, with 70 people already evacuated. Coming up next, actor John Jarrett tells the jury in his rape trial that it was the complainant who seduced him. Revelations a Dubai princess fled her husband after learning of the disappearance of his daughter. And a big win for Britain with streaming giant Netflix taking over a major studio in England. Tonight at 7.30 on the new SBS World Movies Channel 32, it's Brick Lane, the story of an arranged marriage in modern-day Britain. 
Here on SBS at 7.30, the double episode of The Great Has Revival. I'm a real boy! Walt Disney's life and legacy is uncovered in this revealing two-part series. There were no rules. You know, you're kind of free to do anything you want. It's like a dream. In the shorter cartoons, you get people to laugh. Walt Disney now is asking another question. Can you make people cry? <laughs> Relive every magical moment. Walt Disney starts tomorrow 8.40 on SBS and On Demand. At least John's family will be looked after with his life insurance. We need it too, but who should we go with? We need an insurer we can count on, so we should do one simple thing and get real life insurance. You're right. With real life insurance, if you're diagnosed with a terminal illness, you'll get 100% of your benefit amount. It's cover your family can count on from an award-winning insurer you can trust. Call 139 489 or search Real Life Insurance. Easy on yourself. My dream for retirement would be hang out with my grandkids, you know, teach them how to restore a car. I'm with MTAA Super because they're industry-based, super fun, and they're going to be there for the long run. Trapped in here for three hours. I'm still feeling it though. My new car comes with a five year Toyota warranty advantage. I'm still feeling it now. I do get daily fuel discounts with the My Toyota app. So yeah. What about now? Yep. Still feeling it. Great Toyota value stays with you. Like the 2018 Corolla Hatch Ascent Sport with 2.9% finance. Search Toyota value. Oh, what a feeling. Toyota. Engineered to read and adapt to your body like no other chair. And right now you can enjoy 20% off the entire Stressless range. Stressless. Designer comfort made in Norway. A legacy of heroes. A legacy of endures. A legacy of panoramas. A legacy of catastrophe. A legacy of victory. The legacy continues. The Tour de France starts Saturday 8.30 on SBS and On Demand. In celebration of NADOC week, SBS proudly brings you Gurumul. Sunday, 8.35 on SBS and NITV. For SBS News anywhere, anytime, download the app or go to sbsnews.com.au. Foreign fighters seeking to return home to Australia could soon be banned from doing so for up to two years under proposed anti-terror laws. Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton introduced the revised legislation to the lower house today, which would temporarily ban any citizen suspected of extremism. Following this week's anti-terror raids in Sydney, the Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton says the risk of terrorism remains high. The threat is not only beyond our shores, but as we know, here in Australia as well. Today, introducing revised laws that the minister could delay a foreign fighter from returning home for up to two years. They now have the capacity to come back, to put together an IED or to walk into a food court or other place of mass gathering and cause serious death and carnage in our country. The proposal builds on laws introduced to Parliament in February, before the legislative slate was wiped clean at the election. Mr Dutton says this new version adopts 16 of the 18 recommendations from the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Security and Intelligence. The Law Council called the first proposals a dog's breakfast and unconstitutional and is now seeking a further review. Labor is supportive but wants to see the legislation. We support the intent of the legislation, which is to have an appropriate uh, mechanisms in place. It's just a bit too easy to stop them at the border. It doesn't solve the problem. The Home Affairs Department estimates there are 80 Australians who left the country to fight with IS and remain in Syria and Iraq. 
Counter-terrorism experts say it is likely only a small number would try to return, but Australia should bring them back to gain valuable information. I would rather have them in a controlled environment here in Australia and possibly prosecuted than have them travelling to Libya or to Afghanistan or to southern Philippines where they can continue to disseminate uh, their hateful ideology. The last sitting day of the next fortnight has thrown into question the ministerial standards of two former ministers. The Prime Minister today ordering an investigation into allegations Christopher Pine and Julie Bishop breached the ministerial code of conduct. It follows criticism over their decision to take up roles with consulting firms. The code bans former ministers from lobbying on issues related to their former portfolios for 18 months. There is absolutely no indication that uh, the former Minister Payne uh, is or has or is acting uh, in breach of the statement of ministerial standards, but the Prime Minister uh, has uh, sought advice. Now, I think there's a question there that needs to be answered. Calls for a Senate inquiry have been deferred until a later date. Nakari Thorpe, SBS World News. Police allege a man charged with planning a terror attack in Sydney had also been planning to create an Islamic State base in the Blue Mountains near Sydney. A lawyer representing Isaac El Matari made no application for bail for the 20-year-old at court in Parramatta this morning. Police allege Mr El Matari, who was arrested on Tuesday, was at the centre of a plot to attack churches and police stations and also allege he was a member of IS. He will appear in court via video link on the 30th of August. Workers at a Sydney council have returned to work after a strike over the use of the controversial weed killer Roundup. More than 500 staff at Blacktown City Council walked off the job yesterday morning, leaving garbage bins uncollected and services disrupted. The council's now agreed to trial an organic pesticide, bringing the stop work to an end. Actor John Jarrett has told a Sydney court today he was seduced into, cons into consensual sex by a woman who has accused him of rape. The 66-year-old has pleaded not guilty to the alleged rape in 1976. John Jarrett taking the stand today, telling the court it was the complainant who beckoned him into her room. She said she recognised me from picnic at Hanging Rock when we first met and she found me attractive, he said. I feel it was a seduction and I unfortunately participated in it. I willingly had sex and she willingly had sex with me. It was consensual. Mr Jarrett rejected earlier evidence from the complainant that he came into her room smelling of alcohol, pinned her down and raped her. He said he had not been drinking and had driven home. I don't drink and drive, he told the court. Under cross-examination by the Crown Prosecutor, Mr Jarrett agreed that he didn't use the word seduction in his police interview last year, but he denied deliberately changing his account of what happened that night. He also denied numerous questions from the prosecution about intricate details of the alleged rape. I didn't rape her, so what you are describing is a fantasy to me. The court also heard from actor Cassandra McGrath. A friend and colleague of Mr Jarrett since 2004, she told the court she had played the woman who was tortured and murdered by Mr Jarrett's character in the 2005 film Wolf Creek. He expressed to me his disgust and horror at that particular type of behaviour, referring to the actor's role. She said she trusted him completely. The jury is expected to retire to deliberate on a verdict tomorrow. Lynn Evelyn, SBS World News. Well, when Indigenous languages die, so do cultures. Now, a Native American community is fighting to save their language. It's part of a global push sponsored by the UN. That story shortly. As the US trade deficit soars, the Trump administration has revealed it's reviewing export license requests from US companies wanting to sell products to China's Huawei technologies. Huawei remains blacklisted in America and any proposed trade would come with what the US is calling the highest national security scrutiny. The change in policy could affect Australia. Huawei, the Chinese telecoms company that American and Australian intelligence says presents a threat to national security. But the White House is battling a ballooning trade deficit and is now willing to let some US tech companies sell products to Huawei. We'll take another look 
at a number of the uh, export licenses. But only for lower tech products. That is to say, no national security sensitivities at all. Remember, Huawei remains on the entity list. Larry Kudlow says the most sensitive equipment, including Huawei's blisteringly fast 5G technologies, remain off limits. The U.S. has accused Huawei of stealing American intellectual property and violating Iranian sanctions. But in a surprise about face at the G20 on Saturday, President Trump appeared to relax a total ban. We send and, and we sell to Huawei a tremendous amount of product that goes into the various things that they make. And I said that that's OK, that we will keep selling that product. Easing restrictions on Huawei was a key element of an agreement reached with China's president, Xi Jinping, to reopen stalled trade negotiations. The about face leaving Australia, which followed America's lead, in a tricky spot. But certainly the big implication for us is it shows us once again that the US president is capable of flipping on a dime and also that America as a whole is capable of cutting a deal with China, a deal in which Australia isn't involved in. So that's a concern for us. Other US allies, like the UK, did not issue a blanket ban on Huawei. Britain is allowing the company conditional access to its 5G rollout. Tech experts, though, say Australia is unlikely to follow suit. The Australian government already banned Huawei technology from the 5G network, and they did the same in 2012 when it came to the NBN as well. So I don't see that lifting anytime soon. The US and Australia fear Huawei products could be used to spy on people. But some analysts are suggesting the real reason for the crackdown is that Huawei is so far ahead of its competitors when it comes to 5G technology. Gary Cox, SBS World News. Six people have been killed after a tornado hit China. The tornado hit in Kaiyuan in northeast China, injuring 190 people and causing the evacuation of 1,600. Firefighters are still searching through the debris of buildings looking for trapped people. One million people have been ordered to evacuate in Japan after heavy rains hit the southern island of Kyushu. One person has been killed and another is missing after the rain caused massive landslides. The government was criticised last year for its slow response when 200 people were killed in landslides on the island. 240 people have suffered suspected food poisoning at an event celebrating the 90th birthday of former Philippines First Lady Imelda Marcos. The people became sick after eating a breakfast of chicken stew with egg and rice at a sports centre in Manila. The incident cut short what was to be a day-long celebration. A judge in the US has been censured for his handling of a rape case involving two teenagers. Judge James Troiano said the 16-year-old boy who had filmed and shared the incident with his friends should not be tried as an adult because he was from a good family and attended an excellent school. This New Jersey judge under fire tonight after declining the prosecutor's motion to try a 16-year-old accused of sexually assaulting another teen as an adult last summer. The family court judge citing that the young man was an Eagle Scout who comes from a good family who put him into an excellent school where he was doing extremely well. This is absolutely an example of privilege playing out in the judicial system. The teen allegedly took video of the attack and shared it with friends, texting, when your first time having sex was rape. But Judge James Troiano, seen here on this website that rates judges, says he believes there's a distinction between a sexual assault and rape. He goes on to classify rape as generally two or more males involved, either at gunpoint or weapon. Critics say it shows a deep bias in the judge's decision making. I would be shocked to see this result in any case where the defendant was Come, came from a family that w didn't have financial means to send their son to a good high school and that they were college bound. That doesn't happen in those cases. An appeals court has now reversed his decision and that teen will be treated as an adult. In the meantime, there are now calls for that judge to be removed. Well, the wife of Dubai's billionaire ruler has reportedly fled to London with her two children and is seeking a divorce. Princess Haya bint al Hussein is said to have escaped from the United Arab Emirates after discovering disturbing facts about her stepdaughter. 
It looked like a picture-perfect life. She was a former Olympian and Oxford graduate, he a multi-billionaire and the ruler of Dubai, both rubbing shoulders with royalty. But Princess Haya bint Hussein is said to be seeking political asylum in Britain. His sixth wife, she wants a divorce from her husband amid claims he abused his daughter Latifa. When my father cares about is his reputation. He will kill people to protect his own reputation. He, he, he only cares about himself and his ego. Latifa escaped Dubai but was recaptured by commandos and sent home. She recorded this YouTube video before she fled. If you are watching this video, it's not such a good thing. Either I'm dead or I'm in a very, very, very bad situation. Latifa's stepmother, Princess Hire, is said to be living in London in fear for her life, preparing for a high-stakes legal battle. There's been no official comment from Sheikh Mohammed, but renowned for his poetry, he shared his anger in verse on Instagram. You traitor. You betrayed the most precious trust. You no longer have a place within me. I do not care whether you live or die. In an interview two years ago, the princess was candid about the need for women to speak up. But I think in the Arab world in general, and I could probably say for the world in general, um, that women are probably the last people who, who actually admit um, you know, to, having, um, to having a bad day, to not feeling quite well. There's, there's kind of this attitude that you have, to, you have to push on and you just have to keep going. Advocates for women's rights in Dubai say the case raises serious questions about what prompted a wealthy, intelligent woman to flee abroad. Felicity Davey, SBS World News. In the UN's Year of Indigenous Languages, a Minnesota community is fighting to keep ancient native Indian American culture from fading away. It's part of a global push to stop the loss of endangered Indigenous languages. Bitter Sagekwe Peterson Briggs won't let go of the Ojibwe culture without a fight. Yeah. She's teaching students about the Ojibwe and Dakota people to pass on a legacy that's endured thousands of years and is in danger of disappearing. Beyond the spoken word, they're exploring sound, sight and taste. The Ojibwe language is very important to me, specifically, because I didn't grow up speaking it. 600 languages have disappeared in the past century. That's one every two months. A further 40% of the world's remaining 6,700 languages could still be lost. And almost all of those under threat are indigenous. English is a very pervasive language, um, especially now there's a, a, with a lot of uh, uh, the, the politics of the day. Um, uh, Non-English speakers are kind of have uh, a target or they or they stand out more. But languages aren't just falling to the side in favour of mainstream speech. Entire cultures die out with them. Very sadly, I've been present at funerals where we've laid into the, the earth uh, the last person who carried all that, that knowledge, not just for one language sometimes, but for several. In Australia, the issue and its impact on First Nations people is profound. In 1900, there were at least 250 Indigenous languages spoken across the continent. Today, just 13 are still being passed on to the next generation. Uh, language is closely tied to country, where you are, and to spiritual aspects of country. So it's just like pulling out uh, your guts in a way. Go. It's the reason this Minnesota teacher counts her own daughter among her students at Bodote Hall. It's tough growing up not knowing who you are. And that's why the language and culture here at this school is so important. I want my kids here at this school, especially my own child, to grow up knowing who they are. As teachers and parents hope long after they're gone, these tribes and their stories endure. I have an Ojibwe heart and I have um, an English heart. Camille Bianchi, SBS World News. At least 17 Australians a day are dying from cardiovascular disease directly linked to smoking. That's the finding of new research from the Australian National University. It says smokers triple their risk of dying of a heart attack or a stroke. Peter Caravis would light up at least 50 times a day. I had concerns about my health but sort of delayed it, always delayed it, you know, I'll cut down later. That nearly cost him his life. He had a heart attack at the age of 37. I was literally fighting for my life. Uh, it was very traumatic for my wife, my, my family, my work colleagues. 
It's a very traumatic experience and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. Mr Caravis's case is unusual given his age, but the ANU study considered one of the most in-depth in the world has highlighted just how dangerous smoking is to the cardiovascular system. 17 people in Australia die every single day from cardiovascular disease caused by smoking. And we wipe out a population around twice the size of Port Douglas every single year just from smoking related cardiovascular disease. Researchers followed 190,000 people over a seven year period, looking at 36 different kinds of cardiovascular diseases. It found smoking caused more than 11,000 coronary heart hospitalizations a year. Even if someone considers themselves to be a light smoker, the health impacts can be devastating. Smokers who smoke five cigarettes a day were twice as likely to die of cardiovascular disease than people who had never smoked. Experts say more needs to be done to help people kick a habit that costs the health system nearly $2 billion every year. If we were to spend, spend small amounts in prevention, we could reduce that demand on the healthcare system and that would be of enormous benefit to all of us. The Heart Foundation is also calling for the anti-smoking campaigns of the past to be resurrected. What we are calling for is, is the reinstigation of those ads. We've got to make sure that the public, the community, see the dangers and are faced with those consequences each and every day. Quitting by the age of 45 could eliminate up to 90% of the risk, but the message from a reformed smoker is simple. Smoking is very dangerous and if you don't find the time for it now and find the effort now, you will pay for it later. Gloria Clash, SBS World News. Let's check the finance figures now. When the Australian share market finished higher, setting a fresh 11 and a half year high, the major banks led the market gains despite concerns their margins could be hit further by lower interest rates. The mining sector was weaker. The Australian dollar is at a two month high, buying 70.3 US cents and it's stronger across the other major global currencies. Well, the US movement to end male infant circumcision has reached Australia tonight. The feed looks at a new group calling for an end to what it calls forced amputation on children. Michael Hing, what have you found? We've spoken to men who are deeply affected by their parents' decisions to circumcise them at birth. They say they're reclaiming their bodies by restoring their foreskin and it comes as a new advocacy group in Australia is calling for the practice to be actually banned. Forced amputation of children's healthy body parts does not belong in the 21st century. That's tonight on The Feed, 8.30, SBS Viceland. And coming up next, a big production boost for on-demand streaming as Netflix takes over a major studio. Also, giant killer, the 15-year-old who continues to send shockwaves through Wimbledon. Who among them can be persuaded, ignited, to burn this place to the ground? The new season of The Handmaid's Tale, tonight 9.30 on SBS or stream on demand. You have money, pal. What more do you want? One respect. Do you still love him? Loving Pablo. Sunday at 10 on SBS World Movies and On Demand. Celebrate NAIDOC Week with The Point, Nula Live and NITV News from host city Canberra on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. NAIDOC Week with NITV News and Current Affairs starts Monday 7.15 on NITV. Hey, I was thinking, we still need to sort out our life insurance to protect Olivia. I know. And we just need an insurer we can trust, so we should do one simple thing and get real life insurance. Let's do it. Nothing is more important than your family's security. That's why hundreds of thousands of Australians trust real insurance. With real life insurance, your family would receive a cash payment up to $1 million. Call 139 239 or search real life insurance. Easy on yourself. Discover new details about your family story with Ancestry DNA. Find out your ethnic mix. Connect to family, past and present and discover what led to you. Order your kit at ancestry.com.au. The Snooze Massive End of Financial Year sale is on now. And right now, save up to a massive 40% off bed frames. Hurry and Sunday. Find your comfortable at Snooze. Right now at ANZ, 
we're giving away 300,000 Qantas points with any eligible home loan. And the chance to win up to $500,000 off your home loan. An offer so good, you don't need a celebrity. Sorry, Hoff. Be quick. Apply by August 31. There's a world of stories available for free at SBS On Demand. Ready? Stream hundreds of TV shows, movies and more on your smart TV, phone, tablet or laptop. Take our money. Just take all our money. Did we mention it's free? Download the app or visit the website today. And you're now a member. Now streaming. SBS On Demand. A world of difference. Well, the growth of on-demand streaming services is booming as Netflix bolsters its production capacity with the purchase of a major British studio. Shepparton Studios in London opened its doors as a film studio in 1932. Since then, it's been the home of hundreds of films from Clockwork Orange and Alien to Star Wars and Bridget Jones. Everyone knows the best place for a clandestine meeting in London is, and always has been, St James's Park. Good Omens, based on the book by Neil Gaiman, is one of Amazon Prime's biggest ever productions, and it was made in Britain. Crowley and Aziraphale have been meeting here for quite some time. Co-produced by BBC Studios, the series is an example of how a few American web giants are transforming global television. As if Armageddon were a cinematographic show you wish to sell in as many countries as possible. How has Amazon's entry to the UK market changed things for a director like you? A, I mean, in simple terms, there's more money to make things in a bigger scale. I mean, we, Good Omens being made in, as a six half hour comedy with a standard UK budget, we couldn't get it moving. We've now got the resources to actually make a world that is credible to the uh, audience and that engages with the story completely and not, it's not just a, a pared down adaptation. Of course, it's not just Amazon. There is a creative boom going on in Britain driven by SVOD or subscription video on demand. Over the past 10 years, there's been an exponential growth in the value of the film and TV industry in the UK. And its growth has significantly outpaced that of the UK economy. TV today is marrying the best of the old with the best of the new. Shepparton Studios, owned by Pinewood, is where countless legendary movies were shot, and Netflix is moving in. They believe that by investing in local studio space and hiring local staff, they could neutralize concerns about American dominance of the industry. The new Netflix production hub will include 14 sound stages in a total of 435,000 square feet. No one in the history of film or television has caused so much disruption so quickly as Netflix. And the truth is, they're just getting started. The company is pivoting from an American distributor to a global production powerhouse deeply embedded in local economies. Rivals might grumble about the dominance of an overmighty Californian giant, but viewers aren't complaining. And anyway, that showbiz. I mean, that's why we invest so heavily here. That's why our, our original production in, in, in the UK is so, so big. This is about a $2.7 billion business, right, for the television market in the UK that we hope to be a bigger and bigger part of. So our productions have generated about 25,000 jobs already. There's a revolution going on in Britain's creative industries, and this one will be televised. Sport now with Robert Grasso and some possible history in the making at the Women's World Cup. That's exactly right, Darren. Good evening, everyone. The Netherlands is aiming to become the first male or female Dutch side to lift football's greatest prize. It follows a solitary goal in extra time against Sweden in the semi-final. The Netherlands booking a place in the decider against three-time champions, the United States. Yesterday's dramatic win by the United States over England was a tough act to follow. But the Swedish Netherlands fans only cared about a place in the final. Stenius! Can't finish. The Swedes thought they had the breakthrough in the 56th minute, but once again, Van Vienendal was ready. And a touch off to the post. Great save there. When Shanice Van Sanden broke clear in injury time, Netherlands almost snatched it. And it's deflected wide by Lindahl. 
But for the first time in Women's World Cup history, the semi-final was decided in extra time. Breaks nicely, and the shot's in! Beautiful strike by Jackie Grunin! The Ducks' joy unconfined at reaching their first ever World Cup final, and they're not daunted to face the United States either. I've seen the games are a very good team, but it's a final, who knows what can happen, right? Uh, we will do everything in our power to beat them. <laughs> While the defending champions were again busy dismissing criticism of their goal celebrations this tournament, US star Megan Rapinoe defending teammate Alex Morgan and her tea-sipping gesture after knocking England out. The action sparking a number of memes and American Revolution references on social media. Wah, wah, wah. I mean, it's like, we're at the World Cup, what do you want us to do? This is. The biggest stage, the biggest moment. Um, I don't think anyone truly believes that we disrespect the game or disrespect our opponents. The stage set for a thriller in Lyon on Monday morning. John Baldock, SBS World News. And a reminder, you can view the World Cup final live, free and in HD right here on SBS. Join us from 12.30am on Monday morning when holders the United States take on the Netherlands. There's also live streaming on the World Game website and the app. To tennis and US teenager Corey Goff's record-breaking run at Wimbledon has continued into the third round. In the men's draw, Australia's Alexei Popperin's tournament came to an end. Swiss veteran Stan Wawrinka was stunned in five sets, while top seed Novak Djokovic progressed. Ash Barty is the last Australian in the women's singles draw after Alia Tomjanovic crashed out. Seven seats, Mana Halep advanced, while 15-year-old Goff extended her stay with a dominant performance. Corey Goff stuns the tennis world every time she steps onto the Wimbledon grass. The 15-year-old's latest act, a straight sets win over 2017 semi-finalist Magdalena Rabarakova. The newest star shines. Goff playing under the court one roof and looking right at home. She backed up a first round win over idol Venus Williams with another impressive display. Breaking her opponent's serve in the sixth game, the ice cool American took command. Look at the face, just focus. Unflappable in closing out the first set. No clenched fist, no change of expression. In the second, she continued to give her seasoned opponent a torrid time. The fairy tale continuing, the All England Club in raptures. This gets better and better. Caroline Wozniacki awaits next round, Corey unfazed by the stature of her rivals. I think I can beat anyone um, who's across the court and um, if I don't think I can win the match then I won't even step on the court. Alexi Popperin will breach the top 100 after his eye-catching campaign. 30-15. The 19-year-old willing but outclassed in the second round. Russia's Daniil Medvedev triumphant in four sets. Yeah. Better times to come, perhaps. While Victoria Azarenka made light work of Isla Tomljanovic. Oh, that's a crazy point. The Australian claiming just two games in a straight sets defeat. Joel Spreadborough, SBS World News. To AFL and North Melbourne remain confident Majak Dor will make a return to the game this weekend. Dor is on the cusp of an emotional return through the VFL. It follows the 28-year-old's fight with mental health issues. And finally in sport, the AFL's China expansion has moved closer to home. The ongoing initiative in Sydney aims to boost inclusion for kids while embracing the 1.2 million strong local Chinese community. We developed this program from the kids uh, not only for their health benefits but also getting them connected as well as uh, fit into the Australian sports culture. The AFL has taken games to China since 2017 and is opening a full-time office in Shanghai. And that's Day in Sport, Derek. Okay, thanks, Rob. Coming up next, the weather and the big bourbon blaze. Thousands of barrels destroyed in a warehouse fire. Next on the new SBS World Movies Channel 32, it's Brick Lane, a story of an arranged marriage in modern-day Britain. Next on SBS, a double episode of The Great Has Revival. It was like looking at my twin. The ripple effect. My birth mother was also my sister. Of family secrets. I was raised white. My mother was Aboriginal. Single moment and everything changes. Insight now streaming on SBS On Demand. 
The Nick Scarly Lounge Sale is on now. For a limited time, save up to 50% on a selection of lounges, floor stock and discontinued lines. The Nick Scarly Lounge Sale, on now. Australia, we need to talk about turning up your toes, you know, pushing up daisies. And when you have gone to the other side, you want to make sure that your family won't be left with the cost of your funeral. So have a chat with Australian seniors and take out seniors' funeral insurance. You can get up to $15,000 of cover and they'll pay out your full cover amount or all your premiums, whichever's greater. So get on with enjoying life and stop thinking about going to your eternal rest. Call Australian Seniors now on 139 839 or visit seniors.com.au. Union Greek style yogurt. Add a little culture. Three hours in here. Yeah, I'm still feeling it though. Got a great deal on my new Toyota. Really? Get the 2018 Corolla Hatch Ascent Sport with 2.9% finance. Search Toyota Value. Oh, what a feeling. Toyota. It's time to get your expensive business insurance policy out of your system. Go straight to bizcover.com.au, Australia's small business insurance specialist, for multiple quotes from top insurers. There's no nasty paperwork. Simply compare and buy competitive cover online in minutes. Don't pay too much for your small business insurance. Head to bizcover.com.au to compare, insure and save. The Nick Scarly Lounge Sale is on now. For a limited time, save up to 50% on a selection of lounges, floor stock and discontinued lines. The Nick Scarly Lounge Sale, on now. A legacy of heroes. A legacy of endurance. A legacy of panoramas. A legacy of catastrophe. A legacy of victory. The legacy continues. The Tour de France starts Saturday 8.30 on SBS and On Demand. the weather now. A high pressure system near Tasmania extends a strong ridge over the rest of the continent, keeping it generally cloud free. Onshore winds are causing low cloud along the east coast of Australia, which extends into inland Queensland. In the major centres, showers in Brisbane and Sydney, cloudy in Canberra, mostly sunny in Melbourne, Adelaide and Darwin. A storm clearing over in Perth. Looking further afield, showers in Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch, rain in Samoa and Tahiti, partly cloudy in Noumea. Southeast Asia, thunder in Bangkok and Singapore, cloudy in Denpasar and Port Moresby, showers in Phnom Penh. Further north, thunder in Beijing, rain in Hanoi, showers in Hong Kong and Manila, fine in Seoul, drizzle in Tokyo. Heading west now, sunny in Baghdad and Tehran, drizzle in Delhi, rain in Islamabad and Mumbai. Up to Europe, fine in Athens, Belgrade and Madrid, drizzle in Berlin, cloudy in Istanbul and London, some rain in Stockholm. Africa now, cloudy in Algiers, Dakar and Nairobi, fine in Cairo, Casablanca and Johannesburg. In South America, fine in Asuncion and Santiago, showers in Bogota and Caracas, rain in La Paz. And for North America, showers in New York, thunder in Chicago, Denver and Miami, fine in Dallas, rain in Washington and also Havana. Well, for fans of Kentucky's finest, it's enough to drive you to drink. 45,000 barrels of Jim Beam bourbon have gone up in flames following a lightning strike on its warehouse in Woodford County, Kentucky. Fire crews were able to save a second warehouse on the site. Fortunately, there's little chance of anyone going thirsty. The company, of course, operates 126 barrel warehouses in Kentucky. That's about 3.3 million barrels in total. Recapping our top stories now and in breaking news, 10 million Australians are set to receive a tax cut with the government's $158 billion plan just being passed by the Senate. Labor pulled its opposition after four key crossbenchers shifted their support to the coalition. 
Australian student Alex Sigley, who went missing in North Korea more than a week ago, has departed Beijing en route to Tokyo. He was released from detention after Swedish officials intervened. Tensions between the UK and China are rising after the two men vying to become the new British Prime Minister both expressed support for Hong Kong's protest movement. The, com the comments have upset Beijing. And foreign fighters seeking to return home to Australia could soon be banned from doing so for up to two years under proposed anti-terror laws. That's the world this Thursday. We'll have news updates throughout the evening and on SBS and other Bulletin at 10.25 tonight. The SBS news website has all the latest stories. Get news anywhere, anytime with the SBS News app. From the team, I'm Darren Mara. Good night.